We are in Parashat uh, Kitisa, where we face one of the most severe sins of our history, of our nation, that up until today, we're paying for it. Needless to say, this is the sin of the golden calf, and uh, which raises a lot of questions. First of all, how can they do such a thing? They just saw God coming down on the mountain. They saw miracles coming out of Mitzrayim, and they're still able to do such a thing. And there's many different questions, but we want to more find out what is the spiritual significance behind the sin, and how is that affecting me, and what do I need to learn from that? And before we even go to understand that, we, we have to understand the background behind it. Now, there is a, a question, I don't know if you have been to a chupa lately, but when the groom puts the ring on the bride's finger, he tells her, you are hereby sanctified to me, with this ring. And then he says a very interesting part, Kedat Moshe Israel, as the religion of Moshe in Israel. Why are you calling it the religion of Moshe? It's the religion of God. I mean, why are you even saying the word religion? Why aren't you saying it's the rule of God? Why is Moshe uh, mentioned here? Kedat Moshe? Like, what is that? Moshe's invention? Then the meaning behind it is that we know, I mean, we read the Torah a few times. We know that Moshe Rabbeinu had a, a journey and a half with the nation. They drove him nuts. From the moment he came there, he didn't, even, he, he didn't even want the job. When Hashem asked him uh, uh, on the mountains, Moshe Rabbeinu did whatever he could to get away with it. He's like, I don't want this job. Find somebody else. And then he was forced to be in the job. And for 40 years, they drove him completely nuts to a point that anybody else would be like, I, I had it up to here, I quit. So looking at this, at this relationship, Moshe Rabbeinu fought with the nation of Israel for 40 years. But nevertheless, they stayed together. Moshe Rabbeinu never left the nation, and the nation never left him. And this comes to teach us with the bride and groom, in other words, yeah, you're going to be fighting a lot, but you have to stick together. As long as you make it and you stick together, then that's the purpose of the marriage. And you will have a lot of fights. Just get ready. And, uh, and we see in this week's parasha, there's a big, uh, a big uh, problem. There's a very uh, big sin. It's uh, literally a very uh, uh, sensitive time. And uh, this happens to, to, to cause Moshe Rabbeinu to get very upset with the nation. He got so upset that he really didn't know what to do with them. This was not just a regular t a sin or a regular complaint. I mean, they complained to him all the time. We want meat, we want food, we want this, we want that. This was already way be beyond that. To a point that he got so upset that he took the tablets that were in his hand and he smashed them on the, on the ground. Now, some people think that Moshe had a problem with anger, that he needed some anger management. But he wasn't. It actually happened to be that because of the sin, the letters that were in the tablets were contaminated from by the sin. So the letter, letters, they were holy letters, they left the, the tablet. They couldn't sustain in the physical tablet. And the tablet became so strong that Moshe Rabbeinu, they dropped. Because the tra 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 tablets are huge. It's not like what you see you know, uh, in pictures that uh, some guy with the beard, Charlton Heston, is holding like these two small tablets. It's not an iPad. The tablets were massive. They were huge. And once the holy letters left the tablets, they fell down on the ground. It's not, not that Moshe was a hothead individual that smashed it. But nevertheless, the literal explanation here is that Moshe comes down from the mountain and he gets so upset. I don't know if he got upset or disappointed, but nevertheless, the result was the breaking of the tablets. Now, this is a very harsh time in our history. This is a severe sin 
I mean, we had a few severe sins in our history, but this is one of the big ones, the golden calf. And uh, it seems like the nation betrayed Hashem. It seems like they went against Hashem and they made a new God. And comes a big question. If this is the case, if really the nations of Israel betrayed Hashem, why would they choose a calf, <laughs> a, a, a cow? Choose something else. Do something like a little bit more lofty. Why are you choosing an animal? So this is already raising the question, maybe they didn't really betray Hashem. Maybe there was something else there. Because if you're already betraying and you're leaving Hashem, why would you do it to a calf, to a little cow? doesn't make sense. Make something else. And not only that, that if you're already choosing, and, and let's say, uh, why choose an animal? But if you're already choosing uh, to make a, a new God, then choose a human being. Why an uh, why, uh, animal? And if you're already, uh, if this is the case, then it uh, should be a human being. So why don't you make uh, Aaron? Aaron was the one who was left there. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu left. Aaron uh, remained. So appoint Aaron to be the, your new God. Why are you choosing an, a calf from all things that you choose to make a God? Why an, a, a, a little calf? Now comes even a more interesting question. If you're already choosing an animal, why a cow? Why not a duck? They saw a vision. Yes, hold on. But why not a duck? Why not a... Okay, you're saying they saw a vision. So in the vision, they saw an eagle and a lion. Why not a lion? You're right, they did see a vision. But, but in the vision, they saw the chariot. They saw all four faces that were on the chariot. You are 100% right. But why specifically the cow and not the other faces they saw on the chariot, such as the, the, the eagle or the lion? But nevertheless, comes all these questions. Why a calf? Why not a different animal? Why not a human being? Where they, did they really go and betray Hashem? What was really going on there? So first of all, we have to understand that this whole entire scene is to signify something that happens to us on a daily basis. And this is called falling down from my spiritual level. This is called in, in, in Hebrew, called nefilah ruchanit. That I'm holding in a certain level spiritually and I fall down. And this is what it comes to signify. And now I want to find out what's behind it. Because basically, in short words, in other words, this whole scene that we're reading about is coming to teach me for generations that I will also have a, a times, can be every day, can be once a month, can be once a year, that I will fall down from my spiritual level. Now, now we have to understand a little bit the story behind it before we start analyzing it. Now, on the sixth day of the month of Sivan, we receive the Torah. We're all standing in Mount Sinai. We're seeing this whole miraculous show. And we're receiving the Torah. On the seventh day of Sivan, Moshe Rabbeinu says, Okay, guys, I am packing my bags and I'm going for 40 days. I need to learn this Torah. We just received now the quick overview in the Ten Commandments. Now I have to learn it. I have to understand what it means. It says in the Torah that I have to put filling on, it doesn't even say the word filling, it just says a sign on my hand. Okay, I need to know what means a sign. It says, uh, uh, remember the Shabbat. It says in the Ten Commandments, Zachor et Yom HaShabbat Lekotcho. Okay, I need to go through a course. What does it mean to remember the Shabbat? It says that I have to write a mezuzah on my wall. Where? How? Who? When? How big? When do I do it? How do I do it? So Moshe Rabbeinu says, I'm very sorry guys, I am leaving for 40 days and I will be back with all the information that I need to teach you. So a day after Matan Torah, Zayn Sivan, Moshe Rabbeinu packs his bags. Of course, that's my addition. He doesn't, he doesn't pack any bags. But he tells the nations, I'm going to be gone for 40 days. And he goes up, goes up to the mountain. They all look, he ascends into the mountain and disappears. Now, 40 days later, when does he mean that he has to come back? On the 16th day of Tammuz. Very quick calculation, Tetzayin Tammuz. Now, they saw Moshe Rabbeinu leaving on the sixth hour of the day, meaning in the middle of the day, probably around noon in the afternoon, maybe 
uh, you know, it changes with the time of dawn. But we know, based on our teachings of our sages, Moshe Rabbeinu took off. The flight was scheduled for six hours after dawn. He took an El Al flight and he got first class. And that's where the airline got its name, by the way, the El Al. Because he went El, El means two, Al means above. So he went above. That's where the airline got its name. I'm sure the, the somebody thought of what should we name the Israeli airline. And some, some wise guy said, hey, Moshe went up to the Shamaim. He went El Al. Let's call the company El Al. Nevertheless, No, Al El will be above the God. El is a God, but El means to, Al means above. No, 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 El like a God. El means, uh, you say, I, Ani Olech El Hachanut, I'm going to the store. So it's like two. So El Al got the name for Moshe Rabbeinu went up. He, he had, probably has a copyright on the name, they brought the rights. Nevertheless, 40 days, Moshe Rabbeinu is up on the mountain. Now, they're all waiting. Now, let's wait. Moshe's gone 40 days. They're all there biting nails. When is he coming down? What are we getting here? So in the meantime, there are two rulers that stay behind. One of them is Aaron Akoin. He's the left behind to take care of business. And another individual called Hur. He's the son of Miriam the prophet. These are the two people that got the keys to the... To the, to the chamber, to the office. They're now in charge. Now, everybody's waiting for Moshe Rabbeinu. Now, they're counting the days. 39, 38, 37. Now, what happens? They're coming for the day. Comes the day. Tetzayin Betemuz. Comes noon. Nobody comes up. Waiting another, another hour, another hour. Where's Moshe? Why is he not coming? Where is he? Now starting to panic. Wait a minute. The guy said he's coming. It's noon already. It's already a couple hours after. Starting to panic. Now everybody is starting to give all sorts of assumptions. They're all Jews, of course. Don't remember. Don't forget. They're all Jews. He did this. He did that. Okay. One opinion comes and says, We're fools. We were taken for a ride. How can a human being be in Shammai for 40 days and come back? What are we, idiots? We fell for this trick. He left. No, it doesn't matter. We're not upset at him. Maybe he was too good up there and he didn't want to come back. But how can we were taken for fools here thinking that a human being will go up to the mountains with no food, with no drinks. He didn't even take his pillow. You know, sometimes you travel abroad, you see people travel with a pillow, so they have to put their head on the, on, the, on the side. How can he even be alive? Doesn't make even sense. And right away, this opinion was the one who took president, and everybody was like, oh my gosh, Moshe is not coming back. We wasted 40 days. Now came a group of people, they're called the Erev Rav. And they came and took opportunity. They saw Moshe Rabbeinu was not coming. Right away they said, no, he left, he died, he's not coming back. We know the Satan also showed the vision that they showed Moshe's death, that the angels are escorting Moshe and says, hey, he died. And uh, now this uh, Erev Rav, they came and they said, okay, listen, Moshe is not coming. Let's make ourselves a new God. And they said, we're very good at that. You know who the, these the Erev Rav were? They were the top sorcerers of Mitzrayim. Because they saw Moshe Rabbeinu coming with all this uh, hocus pocus. They said, ooh, that's, uh, that's much, more, much more than what we have. And they, these were like the Khartoumim. I don't know if to call them really sorcerers. Rather, they're called Khartoumim. The ones who were doing the sorcery and the witchcraft and stargazers, these are the Erev Rav. They came out, they was like, oh, this is some uh, power here. Specifically, the, there was two of them. One of them was named Yunos, and the other one is uh, Yo Yover Yoveros. Maybe I'm not pronouncing the... the uh, Yon Yonverus. 
That was the, the two Khartoumim that came out of Mitzrayim. There's a part of the Erev Rav. Yonus and Veyon uh, Verus. Nevertheless, they said, listen, let's uh, make a new God. We're good with that. We know how to make gods. So we'll make a new God. Right away, they go to Chur. Chur was the son of Miriam, and they tell him, let's do that. Chur says, no, 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 no. I'm not going to allow such a thing. So they kill him on the spot. No questions. Right away, mafia, shoot him in the head. So they go to Aaron. Now Aaron saw what they did to Chur. Aaron was a little bit more wiser, and he says, listen, if you can't fight them, join them. That's where the term came. Aaron says, listen, what's good going to do if I'm going to fight them? They're going to kill me. So they're going to do anyways what they want. Let me try to manipulate the situation or stall something till Moshe Rabbeinu comes. So they come to Aaron and Aaron says, yes, you know what? I agree with you. But you know what? Today we're tired because <laughs> we're all waiting for Moshe to come. Let's go and rest and let's start from tomorrow. So he was able to stall one more day. Then they come back. Okay, now <coughs> how are we going to do it? So Aaron says, I have an idea. If we're making a god, then it has to be from the best of the best. Go back, go to your tents, and collect from your wife's jewelry. I mean, if we're making a god, it has to be from the best material. Go collect jewelry from your wives. Now him in his mind saying, okay, the wives will never give up the jewelry. And then, then that way I will be able to stall them even more, and I'll gain another few hours before Moshe Rabbeinu is coming. This plan didn't work well. They went to their wives and their wives gladly gave all the jewelry. Now they're coming with all the jewelry and, uh, and, and, and the plan didn't work. So Aaron says, okay, now what am I going to do? Okay, Aaron says, says, okay, I'll take my chance. He takes all the jewelry and he throws it into the fire. And what do you know? A golden calf comes out of the fire. Now the whole story started because of a young man called Micha. Now, the story says that, unfortunately, in Egypt, the, the, they were so mean and so ruthless to these Egyptians that they would give certain individuals a quota of how many bricks they have to make per day. And if they would miss a certain quota of bricks, they would put, instead of a brick, a uh, baby. That's what they used to do. They, they, they would put babies instead of bricks. One time Moshe Rabbeinu goes and he sees a baby stuck in the wall in between the bricks and he sees the baby uh, dying. Moshe Rabbeinu tells the Kadosh Baruch Hu, turns to the two Hashem and says, let me get the baby out. Why is it, I can't stand <coughs> seeing such a sight? So Moshe Rabbeinu gets a very, very harsh answer from Hashem. Hashem tells him, no, these babies that are stuck in the walls, are going to be future to sin against me. So already now they're get, being stopped from doing even the sin. And one way you can look at it is a very harsh answer by saying, no, they're going to sin, I'm stopping it now. If you're looking at it, you can look at it in a positive way that Hashem says, I don't want them to sin, let me, let me stop it right now. So they're not going to even fall to a sin. Nevertheless, Moshe Rabbeinu didn't like this answer and took, pulls the baby out of the wall. And this baby grew up, and his name is Micha. Anyways, this baby, Micha, <coughs> grew up to be one of the Erev Rav. And Moshe Rabbeinu himself saved him. Now the story says that when Moshe Rabbeinu went to bring uh, uh, Yosef's uh, coffin, and he didn't know where it is. They were looking everywhere, where, where's Yosef's coffin? Came Serach. And she said that the coffin is right over there. That's where they dropped it into the water. Now go now dig it. They didn't have submarines and, and, and equipment they have now. How are they going to bring now the coffin from the depth of the ocean? So Moshe Rabbeinu takes a little piece of gold. This piece of gold is called Tas Zahav. Tas is like a little piece. And he writes on it, Moshe engraves on this piece of gold, has two words that are a combination, a very mystical, Kabbalistic combination of words. And this word says, Ale Shov, rise up, ox. Because Yosef was called uh, a, a, an ox. When Yaakov was giving all the blessings, if you remember, he compared all of them to animals. Yehuda was compared to a, a lion, 
and one to a wolf and one to... Yosef was compared to an ox. Moshe Rabbeinu wrote on the piece of gold, rise up, in, he, in English it's two words, rise up. In Hebrew it's ale, and the word ox, shor, ale shor. He threw this piece of gold into the ocean, and whoop, what do you know? The coffin of Yosef comes up. Now what happens? Moshe Rabbeinu was so uh, busy with the coffin, he didn't even notice that that piece of uh, gold was on the coffin, but he was busy with uh, dealing with what he has to do and getting ready to leave Mitzrayim. This young man, Micha, came and took that piece of gold. He saw it and he came and took the piece of gold. And later on, this is the time when Micha actually took this piece of gold and he threw it into the, to the fire. When Aaron took all the jewelry and he threw it into the fire, it's not that the jewelry came out. It was that piece of gold that he threw, Micha threw it into the fire. And what does it say on the gold? Aleshor, come out an ox. And a calf comes out, the son of the, of the shor, comes out of the fire. Now, Aaron is trying with whatever power he has to push it a little bit more. He, whatever he can. Aaron was not participating in it. He was trying to trick them. He was trying to manipulate the situation that... It will gain another day. And really Moshe came one day later. That was the mistake. There was a calculation here with the hours. Because Moshe Rabbeinu didn't tell them I'm coming. Didn't tell them the date I'm coming. He just says I'm coming in 40 days. And obviously it was a miscalculation here. And what happens? Instead of coming on Tetzayin Betamuz, Moshe Rabbeinu comes back on Yudzayin Betamuz. And that's the day. I mean up until today we fast on Yudzayin Betamuz. The 17th of Betamuz. That's when the tablets broke. That's when Moshe Rabbeinu comes. Of course, Moshe Rabbeinu already hears the news in Shemaim. Shem tells him, Lech red el ha'am, ki shechet amcha. Go down to your nation. They, they, they sinned. Now, hearing news, it's not like seeing news. In the beginning, Moshe heard it. He's like, no, 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 no chance they did it. He comes down from the mountain. He sees with his own eyes. And breaks the tablets. Now, <clears throat> Like we said, he didn't physically broke them. They just, the Kedusha, the holiness, parted and the tablets fell down. Now, the Erev Rav, which really there's no uh, right translation to Erev Rav. Erev is mixed, a mixture. And uh, Rav can be translated as a f somebody who fights, Lariv. Somebody, Rav, can be also a Rav, a rabbi. Rav, somebody who's in control. But nevertheless, up until today, we have a mixture of this Erev Rav. People who look like me, with beards and peot and suits and hats and pray three times a day and managing yeshivot and, and a big organization. And their entire agenda is nothing but money and power and to, to, to make people fail. They just celebrate Purim every day. Every day they have a costume on. But they're not really have any agenda to do Hashem's work. Nevertheless, they had a very f hard uh, uh, argument. How can it be that a human being will survive 40 days in the mountain? It can't be. But nevertheless, we know Rambam, for example, said, no, actually Moshe lived physically in the heavens. It wasn't that he left the body behind and the Neshama went. Moshe physically lived in, the, in Shemaim. He took his body up to Shemaim. And he, Rambam even says, no, he was in such a high spiritual level that his body didn't need food. And his body didn't need sleep and his body didn't need drink. He was in a very, very high spiritual level. There is a Midrash that says, specifically on the Midrash on Parashat Azino, that it says... That's what it's talking about. It's talking about that Moshe says on himself, 40 days I didn't drink anything, I didn't eat anything. Moshe himself saying, I worked hard to get this Torah for you. I, I, I fasted for 40 days. You know what it is to fast for 40 days? Now in two days we're going to fast for 12 hours. People are already starting to get uh, dizzy from thinking of one fast. They're already thinking, how can I get uh, my, uh, a way out of it? Moshe Rabbeinu says, I had to work really hard to get the Torah. 
Meaning that, yes, you're right, I survived up there. I fasted for you. Comes a big question. Now, how did they expect a calf to replace Moshe? I understand you're appointing a human being. But a calf? An animal? What's the logic behind it even? More than that, if, if it was Moshe Rabbeinu who died, so what if he died? Why are you betraying God? Why are you changing a God? Say, say okay, our leader died. Let's get a new leader. Why are you changing the God here? Why are you believing now in a new God? I understand. Okay, let's believe for a second. Let's listen to the argument of the Erev Rav that Moshe Rabbeinu is human. There's no chance he survived on the mountain for 40 days. Okay, I'll accept that. But why are you changing the God? Why are you going against God? Wait for God to appoint a new leader. Or say, okay, no leader. Let's just uh, direct our faith into God. Why are you now creating a new God? Now, our, our, the commentary explains gives an answer to that and they say they weren't looking for a new God they were looking for a new leader that was their thing they said okay we accepted that our leader died we need a new leader so the commentary comes and says no well let's move one question out of the way they weren't looking to replace God they were looking to replace a leader now they understood that they need a, what's called a memutza a connector between them and God. They knew that. We, up until today, we need that. That's why, we, 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 that's why Mashiach is a human being. There's a huge question. Why does Hashem need Mashiach? Can't He come Himself and do whatever He wants? Why do we need a human being? Because that's how it works. It has to be a connector, a mediator between us and God. And that's a Moshe Rabbeinu. And that's why Mashiach is also going to be a human being. But they knew that they had to have a connector so they, they didn't want to replace God. They just said, okay, we want a new leader. With that said, okay, so you want a, leader, a new leader. But why are you choosing an animal? You said you want a new leader. Go to Aaron and tell him, Aaron, please be our, our new leader. Or go to somebody there. Why are you choosing an, a calf? The Eben Ezra explains a commentary, exactly what you said. Everybody in Matan Torah saw the chariot, what Yechezkel, the prophet, saw. I mean, we know, this is a midrash that says what a maidservant, shifcha, ma shifcha ra'ata alayam, what a maidservant saw on the ocean, the prophet Yechezkel ben Buzid didn't see what they saw, the, the miraculous sight. Yeah, they saw Hashem coming down on the mountain, hovering on the chair of glory, and what's holding the chair of glory? Four faces, a face of a human, a face of a lion, a face of an eagle, and a face of an ox. They saw the chariot. So, the Eben Ezra says, yeah, well, they saw the four options. So they said, okay, what's uh, most appropriate to be the mediator? One of the representatives of the chariot. Either the ox, either the eagle, either the lion, or either the man. So if this is the case, they just wanted to uh, switch a leader. They said, okay, we're not looking to, to betray God. We're just looking for a new leader. That's why after that, after Moshe Rabbeinu came down, there was a plague. 3,000 people from the Erev Rav died, and that's it. So if this is the case, comes another question. Why a cow? So choose an eagle. Or an ox, or, or, or the lion. Or there's a face of a man there. So choose a man. Why from all four faces of the chariot, specifically the, the calf? Just choose Aaron. Aaron was pretty high up there. He's the brother of Moshe Rabbeinu. He proved already that he also has prophecy in Ruch HaKodesh. Choose him. I think he's a good leader. There's a story that maybe will kind of shed some light on it. There is a certain rabbi, he's known as the Meshech Chochma, Rabbi Meir Simcha Cohen. He was the, the rabbi of Dvinsk. He lived about, I think, about 150 years ago. Very, very, very unique individual, big tzaddik. And he's known as the Meshech Chochma. That's his... Uh, when the previous rabbi of Dvinsk died, he was convinced they're going to come to him. 
because he was the most appropriate individual to take the leadership. They didn't. They went everywhere but to him. So in the beginning he got a little bit offended, but he says, okay, whatever, I don't care. He just didn't understand why they're not coming to him. He says, I'm the most appropriate one. And when this happened, he says, I understand now the golden calf sin. That's what he said. This is a big tzaddik. And he says, I understand why they did the golden calf. Because when you're looking for something new, you're looking for something different. When you're looking to replace something, you said the old one was fine, but let's start look for something new now. So he says, the previous Rebbe of Dvinsk died. They're not looking for something that is similar. They're looking for anything but the similarity. And he says, now I understand what they did the golden calf. Because they said, okay, we had already a Moshe Rabbeinu. Look, let's look for something new. Something that we didn't have yet. So we don't want a human being. Rather, we want an animal. And, uh, and uh, from, from that, he understands that, that they chose the calf. So, and they understood that the way to receive the face of the Shekhinah will be specifically from the face of the ox. That's what they understood from that. Now, this is the you know, simple explanation what, where the golden calf came from. They figured out Moshe Rabbeinu died. They didn't want to betray Hashem. They just needed a new leader. They said, okay, let's appoint the leader. Okay, we had already a human being before that. Let's do a, a calf. I think it sounds pretty good. Everybody in favor? All in favor? Let's do a calf. Yalla, let's go. So this is a very simple explanation of what was really happening there. But we want to look at something a little bit more deeper than the surface, what really happened there. There's a story with the Magid from Azrij. He's known as the student of the Baal Shem Tov. And the Baal Shem Tov had many students, but one specific student that uh, continued his path, and he's known as the Magid from Azrij. Later on, he was the Rebbe, the teacher of all the great pillars in the Hasidic world that came to study in his yeshiva. He was located in a city called Mazrij. Physically, he was a sick man. He couldn't travel like the Baal Shem Tov. And everybody went to learn from him. And all these big names that we hear in the world of Hasidut all studied in the same yeshiva. The Noam Elimelech, Elimelech from Lijansk, Rabbi Zusha from Alnipoli, uh, the, the Levi Yitzchak from Bardichov, and uh, Israel from Rojin, Rabbi Shneur Zalman from Liadi, the Balatanya. Everybody went to that yeshiva to study for, from, and the, each one of them went back to their place and started spreading their teachings. And they came from all over the place. I mean, from Poland, from Russia, from many different places. The Mangit from Azrij had a son, and one day he sees his son crying. He tells him, why are you crying? The son tells him, because, you know, I was playing now with the, all the kids here, a game, and this game is called hide and seek. And one kid has to uh, look for all the other ones that are hiding from him. And he says, I played the game and it was uh, my turn to hide. And I was hiding. And after a while that they couldn't find me, they gave up and they left. And I'm now, nobody found me. And I'm crying. So the Magid from Azij started crying with him. And says, now I understand, now you should understand how God feels. God hides himself and he wants us to look for him and we give up very easily and we stop looking for him. Now you understand how God feels. God conceals himself from us. How does he conceal himself? We don't see God around here. We don't feel him. We maybe believe in him, but we don't see anything. And more than that, to, to even make the challenge even greater, then God starts throwing challenges into our life. Basically, in other words, hiding himself even more. Because everything would be good. You know when God is the best God? When you have a good job, when you're healthy, when you find your other half, and everything is going swell. God is the best God. <laughs> First challenge that hits, that's it. I don't like God anymore. That's how it works. So when life goes very smooth, then you love God. And God is the best and you talk great about him and he did this and he did that. And till the first slap in your face, then you're like, okay, I don't like this God anymore. 
So Hashem hides himself through these challenges that we have and he says, now look for me. And when we don't look, we give up very fast. We are very quick to say, okay, I'm out of this game. And you turn around and you stop looking. And what happens is, if I think that God is not there, then I believe that he doesn't exist and I turn around. And, they and you leave. So, basically saying in other words that Hashem says, I hide from you, but don't give up. Don't fall into despair because you don't see me. Look for me. Work hard. I, what's the point if you just see me? And the point is that I want you to work hard. I want you to go through a challenge and I want you to understand and that you have to work hard to find me. Now, there is a story in the Talmud that it says that the sin of the calf was a plot. It was a conspiracy. It's called Nora Alila al Bnei Adam. It was a, a, a plotted or, or planned by the Kadosh Baruch And it says there that the sin had to happen. It had to happen one way or another. The Kadosh Baruch said, okay, I have to put them through something, through a certain situation, and I, 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 I plan for it to happen. This is what the Talmud says, that the sin had to happen. The Kadosh Baruch had a conspiracy against the humans for only one reason. God wanted them to be a Balei Tshuva. He says that now they're Tzadikim. They went through going out of Mitzrayim. They counted the seven weeks. They elevated themselves. They refined themselves. Then came Matan Torah. They were elevated to a very high level of Tzadikim. Then they all died because we know that every time that Hashem spoke, their soul went out of their body. And which the reason for that was because some sins, you can't get your kapara, your atonement, in this world. You can't bring a sacrifice, you can't do anything. And one of them is Chilul Hashem. When a person desecrates the name of Hashem, you can do tshuva in this world, it's not going to help. A person has to die. The death is what will atone for that sin. So Hashem said, no problem, I'll kill you all. I'll just reveal myself a little bit more. All the souls jumped out of their bodies. And then he put them back into their bodies. They all had a near-death experience. And then he was able to atone for their sins. So they all became tzaddikim. Shem says now, oh, this is not enough. I want them to be balei tshuva. I want them to do tshuva. What's the way to, for them to do tshuva? They have to sin. Now if I want the tshuva to come from a very deep place and that it should reach to a very high place, then the tshuva has to be coming from a very severe sin. So the Talmud says, yeah, Kadosh Baruch Hu wanted them to be Balei Tshuva. He made them sin. Very simple. And specifically, Kadosh Baruch Hu uh, 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 made it that they fall in a severe sin, not something small. <clears throat> Basically teaching us, in other words, the more that Hashem pushes you away from Him, the more He wants you. If the challenge is small, then means that the, the, the separation, the distance is small. But when the challenge is big, the more Hashem pushes you away, the more Hashem wants you to be closer to Him. That's why our sages say when you have challenges, accept it with, with a lot of love. A lot of, it's Hashem's way of hugging you. It's Hashem's way of kissing you and saying to you, I love you. I want you to be close to me. Now, if I already have failed in a sin, which happens to us 17 times a day, but if I already failed in a sin, that just means that Hashem really wants you close to Him. So that's why He allows it to, to happen. And that's why He puts such a big Yetzirah. That's why He puts so many challenges, because He wants you to rise above your level and do tshuva. And not to fall and say, okay, you know... I'm such a, a bad person. I did so many bad things. Eh. No, Hashem says, no, I want you to do tshuva. I want you to rise to the occasion. I want you to get up, brush the dirt off, and says, okay, nothing happened. I'm going to go above my level. And this is a called the Baal tshuva. You know, it says where, uh, uh, in Hebrew it says, <laughs> This says, it says in the Talmud, that a place where a Baal Tshuva stands, a complete tzaddik cannot stand. Because the tzaddik doesn't have the temptation. 
The tzaddik doesn't have the challenge and the, ar- the, 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 the battle. So the Baal Tshuva has that. You know, the example for that you can find in the parasha that is called Lech Lecha. Lech Lecha is when Avraham Avinu goes out of uh, Haran. Now, one can look at this. Uh, this was Avraham Avinu's going up. That's where he got elevated. That's when he became a Avraham. First, he was rak only Avraham. But then he became the Avraham. He became a much higher level. One can say, no, Parashat Lech Lecha is Avraham's uh, uh, promotion. That's when he became a much greater leader. But then again, we see here uh, a, f- a falling. Avraham Avinu had a nefilah, we call it. He failed. How? That when he was going out of Mitzrayim, he... he uh, they went, uh, sorry, when they went out to Haran, they went to Mitzrayim. Sarah was taken hostage by the Egyptians. And then he says, Atayadati ki efat mareat. Now I've noticed that you are gorgeous. Oh yeah? Where were you for 70 years? That you didn't notice that your wife is gorgeous? What, you were b- busy somewhere else? No. He was uh, so holy that he never even, either never looked at his wife, or either he was such a holy level that he didn't see her physical beauty. Now that the Egyptians took her, he says, now I realize how beautiful you are. In the level of Avraham Avinu, he went down in his level. Before, he was in such a high level that he didn't look at the physical beauty. He just saw the inner soul, the inner beauty. Here, now he sees, his, suddenly he sees her body, he sees her face. And he says, now I know that you're pretty. Avraham Avinu went down. So what was the cause for the elevation is the fact that he went down. He had to go down. That's why physically he went to Mitzrayim. He had to go down south, down in the level in order to ascend. This is called a Yerida Letzorech Aliyah. And it seems that he's going down. But really, the whole parasha is talking about Avraham Avinu going up. And, and it had to be with going down, with an with, uh, with ascending. So... We see that the Kadosh Baruch will put me in a situation that I will fail. That I will go down in my level. Why? So I can rise up. And when I rise up, I rise up to a much higher level. It says in the Talmud, specifically in the tractate of Oda Zarah, page 40, that Rabbi Yochanan said in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and he said, the sin of David Amelech wasn't a sin. He's not really, we see it as a sin. David HaMelech didn't sin. In his level, it wasn't really a sin. And not only that, Rabbi Yochanan says in the name of Rabbi Shimon, even when the nation of Israel sinned with a golden calf, it's not a sin. It wasn't a sin. Why? Because the, 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 it was a conspiracy, so to say. They, they, they made it that they will sin. And you know what? Then you can't hold a person accountable when you, when you trick him, so to say. Same thing here. You know how many times we do sins... And we're forced to do the sin. And there's not going to be a judgment for that. And there's not going to be a punishment for that. Because Hashem wanted to put me in a situation to test my reaction. To see if I will get upset. To, fee- to see if I would lose my temper. To see that if I will lose my, my, my uh, you know, uh, how do you say, optimism. That I will become sad and depressed. To see if I will let all my anger at everybody around me. Hashem is constantly testing my, my reactions. So Hashem will, so to say, manipulate the situation that I will fall into a sin. And now he says, okay, now let's see how he reacts. If I rise to the occasion and says, nothing happened here, I brush all my dirt, I'm sorry, I apologize, I will do tshuva. Or if I go ballistic and I start cursing and yelling and kicking and, and screaming and fighting, and it's all a test. So the specific place in the Talmud says, no. There was a test from the Kadosh Baruch. The Kadosh Baruch wanted to see our reaction. How are we going to react? How are we going to do? What are we going to do? And more than that, Hashem wanted us to be uh, a Baal Tshuva. Specifically to teach me a very deep and strong foundation in my, in my Avodat Hashem. Hashem wanted to teach us 3,400 years ago that you will sin. But you know what? You can always do Tshuva. Hashem wanted to teach us that there's always this op- the possibility to do tshuva. Always. Doesn't matter what I'm going to do. There's always the hope and the ability to rise up. 
Because if there wouldn't be such a sin, we would not learn that there is even an option of doing tshuva. Here we learn from the Torah that such a severe sin of a golden calf and Hashem forgave them. Hashem still brought them into Eretz Israel. They still got the second tablets. Meaning, in other words, there's hope for everybody. It doesn't matter what you do. Just do tshuva. Do genuine tshuva. Basically coming to teach us that at a place of a Baal tshuva, a complete tzaddik cannot stand. And Hashem wanted us to be Baal tshuva. Now there's a big difference between a Baal tshuva and a Choser b'tshuva. These are two terms that we use a lot. Choser means return. It means that today I do tshuva, tomorrow I'll do the sin again. And then I'll do tshuva, and uh, for one week I'll be, I will be able not to do it, and then I'll sin again. So this is returning. Choser means to return. So when I do tshuva, I go back to the sin. I go back to the tshuva, back to the sin, back to the tshuva, back to the sin. This is chozer b'tshuva. But ba'al tshuva, ba'al is the owner. When I own something, then you can't take it away from me. And of course, in the physical world, you can own a property and it will be taken away from you. But the idea of ba'al tshuva is that I own it. That I, I mastered it. And I don't never go back to that place. This is a ba'al tshuva. And bemet... The level of a Baal Tshuva is a higher level than a Tzaddik. There's a place in the Zohar that is talking about the different levels in Gan Eden, where each soul is going to be. And it's a very long uh, Mahamar in the Zohar. But it says, the first level of, of Gan Eden, the second level, the third, the fourth level of Gan Eden, he says there that all the people who died on Kiddush Hashem, on sanctifying the name of Hashem, they're in the fourth level of Gan Eden. The Haugei Malchut, the martyrs, that died, they were murdered because they were Jews. The babies, they were murdered. Tinokot Shel Bet Rabban. Just imagine, like, what, what, a, what a high level is there. And he says in the Zohar, then on the fifth level, above that is the Baal Yishua. Much higher than that. To a point that our sages say very clearly that where the position, the level where the Baal Yishua stands, is greater than a tzaddik. Why? Because the tzaddik doesn't have the challenge. The tzaddik doesn't have the, the, the fight, the daily fight. That's how great it is to be a Baal Tshuva. There's a story to emphasize the idea that there was once a king, and the king was looking for somebody to take over, to be the second to the king, or maybe to inherit his position. He got his advisors and he says, listen, I need to find the second to the king. Go and look throughout the land. Okay, they posted ads everywhere. We're recruiting anyone who wants to uh, apply to the position. Please come forward. 10,000 men stepped forward. They started giving them all sorts of tests. From 10,000, they narrowed it down to 1,000. Continue giving them all sorts of tests, checking them out. They narrowed it down to 100. From 100, they narrowed it down to 10. Finally, after months of tests, they narrowed it down to three guys, three men. They come up to the king and they tell the king, okay, we narrowed it down to three guys. These are the most highest potential to be appropriate for this job. Okay, what do you want us to do now? The king says, okay, let's give them their final test. Each and every one of them is going to be locked, locked in a room a whole night. And each and one of them is going to get a special bottle of wine that is my specific go uh, 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 king's wine. And the one who's not going to drink from the wine is going to be the second to the king. Now, we don't understand what it means to sit next to a bottle of wine, but in a, uh, to, to, to put it in our uh, perspective, it's almost like putting uh, uh, drugs in front of a drug addict, that he will go through a wall to get his uh, little drug. That's how much the desire was to, for this wine. Okay, they're locking all of them in the rooms. Clicking the watch, okay, now let's see. Oh, waiting there all night, what's going to happen? Everybody's placing bets, number one is gonna take. No, number three, I'm telling you, he's better than number one. Everybody's, the whole nation is anxiously waiting to see what's gonna happen. Comes the moment to open the doors. All the cameras, CNN, Fox, all of them are standing there waiting. All the reporters, now let's gonna see. Drum roll, they're opening the first lock, the second lock, they're opening the door. See the guy sitting like this. The bottle of wine is next to him, sealed. He didn't touch it the whole night. Wow! Everybody is, look at that. That must, must be the next king. 
Okay, they're going to the next door. Cameras are ready, all the reporters are standing there, drum roll, they open the door, they're looking, they see the guy on the floor, uh, all drunk, the bottle is open, completely finished, just say, okay, this guy, he's definitely not getting anything here. He got the wine as a present. Now they're coming to the third door. Drum rolls, cameras are there, everybody waiting, they're opening the door, they see the guy sitting on his bed, they're looking at the bottle of the wine, Bottle of wine is opened, and about this much is missing from the bottle of the wine. The king says, that's going to be the man. What? You just told us that the one who doesn't drink from the wine will be the second to the king. He drank from it. The king says, you are right. He did. He opened it and he drank from it. But you know what? He sat there the whole night looking at the bottle after he tasted the wine and he didn't finish the bottle. He had the power after he tasted the wine. He knew the taste, not to touch it the whole night. And that's the type of man that I want to be the second to the king. And this is about Shuvah. To keep the bottle low and close, big deal. You never tasted what it means to sin. But to taste the sin and then not to touch it anymore, that's a very high level. This is about Shuvah. That's what Hashem wants. He says, I want strong people that I gave them a challenge. They failed. They tasted what it means to, t to sin. And all their life, there's going to be a battle. There's going to be a challenge to go back to it or not, to go back to it or not. And they fail and they go back and they fail and they go back to the point that they rise above and says, that's it. That is it. And to give up something that is under your skin, it's almost impossible. I have the highest respect to the people who are ex-drug addicts, ex-alcoholics, ex-whatever it is, because they had something so strong and they were able to break, break free from that, break loose completely. People look at these people as, you know, a second-class citizen. Hey, he's an ex-drug addict. I want to see a normal human being not touching their drug for 40 years. I really have the highest respect for them. I talk in a lot of groups, AA, NA, all these groups. I have such high respect for them. I know what it is to be addicted to something so strong and to break free from that and to live 30, 40 years clean. That's very, very high respect. And Hashem says, I want Baal Tshuvas. I don't want Tzadikim. I want strong Baalei Tshuva that they know what it means to sin and they rise up to the challenge and that's why Hashem, so to say, orchestrated. He manipulated the situation. There will be such a, sh a sin, like the golden gaff, a severe sin. Why? So for 3,400 years, we're going to live with the sin in the back of our mind. We sinned once. We almost got completely destroyed. Hashem told uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to give you a different nation. Moshe Rabbeinu says, no, 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 let's give them another chance. Let's give him another chance. And the whole point of this story is that Hashem is telling us, I want to show you that I'm willing to give you another chance. Doesn't matter what you did. Even a something so severe like idol worship, betraying me, I will still forgive you. I'll give you another chance. Let's see now what you're going to do. Don't blow it up this time. And the message behind the story in the parasha is so clear and obvious and deep at the same time that Hashem says it's never too late. Doesn't matter how old you are. You can do tshuva when you're 90 years old. 90 years old, you'll still do tshuva, and I will accept everything, and I'll retroactively switch everything around. And this is the message we have to carry with us, that Hashem says, I want you in a high level. I want you to be about tshuva, because you know what? Where about tshuva stands, a complete tzaddik doesn't stand. So Bezad Hashem, we should take this message and internalize it, that I can always make a change. Because I, as a human being, as an observant individual, as a person that wants to connect myself to Hashem, I is facing every day with challenges. And the challenges can be something simple, and a lot of the times the challenges are questioning my entire foundation of my belief. Am I doing the right thing? Look at me. I mean, am I really do am I in the right place? That's what happens to many people. They become a Baal Shuvah. After 20 years, they look in the mirror. What am I doing? They go to some family affair, and everybody's like, are you, are you okay? Are you fine? Are you sure you have all your you know, wires connected up there? 
you, you know, we'll accept you back. I'm observing for 17 years. I still go to sometimes to family and they're telling me, you know, you can make a U-turn. You can cut the beard. You're a handsome man. You can get a nice lady. You can uh, go back to your way. You and you know, yeah. And many people that they become a Baal Tshuva or a convert, they reach a certain point in their life with some identity crisis. What am I doing? Is this, a, am I okay? I totally changed my life. And I'm so devoted to this whole Torah, maybe I lost my mind. Maybe this whole thing is, 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 is a hoax. Maybe somebody's fooling me and everybody's telling me, are you out of your mind? Look at you. So we're all facing with these questions and these doubts. Not I'm talking about a challenge right now that I can't pay my rent. That's another type of a challenge that Hashem is hiding himself and he wants to see if I will have emunah and say, no, Hashem can pay my rent. If he pays millions of people's rents, he'll pay my rent too. There's many levels of these challenges. How Hashem is testing my belief, my trust, my level, how much I'm going to stick to the Kadosh Baruch Hu. But there's even a, even a greater test here. Wait a minute, people can come to points in their life and they doubt their own emunah. Well, maybe, maybe I lost it. Maybe it was one drink too much and maybe I'm not doing the right thing. Maybe I am cuckoo. The parasha comes to teach me, no, you're totally normal. You are totally fine. You are exactly where you're supposed to be. And the reward for that is huge. To be able to serve Hashem without seeing Him. You know, Moshe Rabbeinu was able to see all the generations forward. Moshe Rabbeinu saw everything. He, you know, took a, Hashem took the movie of this world and fast forwarded it like we had in the VCRs 20 years ago that you, blah, 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 and it goes fast. Now they just skip channels in the DVD. When I was a kid, there was a VCR and we would fast forward, we would see the whole movie fast. Moshe Rabbeinu saw the whole movie fast and he was most impressed with our generation. And Hashem tells him, that's what you're impressed of? I just showed you an era of prophets. I just showed you, showed you an era of Tanaim, of sages, huge giants. I just showed you Mekubalim and Rishonim and Achorim. That's what you're impressed from? Moshe Rabbeinu says, yes. Because to be a, a good individual when you have Bet HaMikdash and you see the Shekhinah with your eyes, it's not a big deal. To be able to be an observant Jew when you have a prophet in front of you, that's not a big deal. But when you don't see anything, no Bet HaMikdash, no godly revelation, no prophets, no nothing, and you still serve Hashem with all your heart, that deserves credit. Moshe Rabbeinu says, that's the generation that I have the highest respect to. Because they don't see any type of godly revelation and they wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning to go to the freezing cold mikveh and they pray shacharit and learn Torah and say birkat amazon after eating and observe Shabbat and doing all these things without seeing any godly revelation. That's the generation that will receive Mashiach because they're doing it with all their heart. The real emunah. So the parasha comes to give me a very solid message that yes, Hashem is going to be hidden from us Till Mashiach is going to come. And there's going to be a lot of challenges. And there's going to be a lot of doubts in my belief. And a lot of doubts in what I do. And everybody's going to come and laugh at me. And put me in, 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 a, in a corner like saying, you're out of your mind. And as constantly is going to be this battle. Am I doing the right thing? Is it normal to go cuckoo five minutes before Shabbat like a chicken without a head? And when 99% people in the world are cooking their meal quietly and uh, who cares if it's 5 o'clock now or 6 o'clock so the meal will be ready at 6.05 big deal and here I am like a chicken without a head oh my god I have 3 minutes put the chicken in the oven and if you would make some, some, some uh, show on what happens in Jewish kitchens half an hour before Shabbat this will be the top rating in the world people will be like these people are uh, are Lunatics are insane, and we're still counting to the minute. Do I have time? Do I have time? No, it's past the minute. Okay, I can't take a shower anymore. People would look at us from the outside. This, this nation is a nuts. We're nuts. We're crazy. We're crazy, but we're crazy about Hashem. We're crazy about Hashem, and we're crazy about the Torah. And that's what the Torah comes to teach me in this parasha. You, you're not crazy. You are totally normal. 
And yes, there will be a lot of tests and a lot of challenges and what you're doing is going to look completely ridiculous to you. But you know what? That's part of the game. And Hashem is waiting, He's looking, He's hiding Himself on purpose. Let's see if you find me. There's an excitement here for Hashem. I want you to, to find me. I want you to work hard. You think you're going to get something from working for free? No, work hard. You know, when I, when I grew up, I, my father was, was very, do, did very well and a lot of money. But he always made me work. All my friends, I lived in an upscale neighborhood. Everybody got their cars and their motorbikes. My father said, you're going to work. I'm not giving you anything. Which at the time, I thought he's the worst father. But now I look back and I was like, he's the best father. Because I'm looking at all these people who grew up with me. They all are, they, they don't know how to function in the world. They're depending on a check coming every month from a father. And I'm one of the only ones from the crowd that I know. My father told me when I was 11, you want something? Go and work. I work, you work. I used to paint fences, take things, the garbage out. I would clean cars. Yeah, this world is about working. It's not about receiving checks once a month. Go and deal with the world. Work hard. Shem says, I want you to work. I want you to become Baal Tshuva. I want you to quench into to, the, the, the juice is going to come out of you. And you know what? When you have a challenge, this is not a failure. This is what society will tell you. If you failed, you are a failure. If you failed, means that you just fell down so you can rise higher. We call it a Yerida Letzorech Aliyah. Going down in order to rise up. Uh, the, the easiest word to, to put it is to catch momentum. You want to jump over a fence? You have to go back. You can't jump over the fence. You go 100 meters back so you can run, 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 run and jump over the fence. So Hashem says, I'll help you. I'll push you on the floor. Now you get up. Very simple. Just get up. Zad Hashem, we should uh, internalize this message that Hashem has something installed for us. Hashem is, has a plan for us. Not to get discouraged so fast, not to, get so, not to give up so fast when there's a challenge. And to understand that the, this, this separation from Hashem, this unclarity is how Hashem is expressing, I want you to be close to me. Work hard and you'll rise to a high level, another level and another level. And don't think that you're stopping. You reach to one level, come, come the next challenge. Hashem will push you again. Till the day that you leave this world, or the day that Mashiach comes. People think that maybe when you retire, when you're 65, 62, 68, whatever it is, depending on the country, that, you, that the, that's the same thing when you're serving Hashem. No, you never retire with Hashem. You're 90 years old, you're still growing. And believe it or not, people in their 80s, they have challenges and ups and downs. But we should take from that the lesson that these challenges and these ups and downs is only for our benefit. It's only to become closer to Hashem. And needless to say that when we apply that, that's how we survived as a nation, because we're holding on to the Kadosh Baruch Hu and saying nothing's going to move me from Hashem. Bezad Hashem, we should learn from that also to look at other people and in, in, in their failure and not to judge other people. It's very easy to look at another person and say, ah, oh, look, he's a failure. No, he's not. He's going through his challenges. And when I judge another person, then I, I'm bringing on myself triple of his challenges. I have to look at any other person and say, okay, I also have challenges. I also fail here and there. And sometimes I fail a lot. The point to take from that is that it's never too late. There's always a place to do tshuva. And now we're standing in a very auspicious month to do tshuva in the month of Adar, where Hashem accepts the tshuva very, very easily. And a few days from now, we're celebrating Purim. This is a very auspicious time to do tshuva to a point that I can transform everything. When I focho, everything can be transformed from bad to good. The point to take from that is that we have to do one last kvetch here and then the thing that we most don't believe in, that Mashiach is coming, will actually become a reality. We spoke about it yesterday in Shabbat. Most people don't believe Mashiach is coming. They say they do, but they don't believe. Very few people believe, really believe He's coming and they're prepared. So we have to do the last kvetch, the last uh, effort, so we can see the ultimate concealment come as a revelation. And then needless to say, what a reward are we, gonna, what are we re we're going to receive? What a high level of spiritual revelation we're going to encounter very soon with the coming of Mashiach. And Bezrat Hashem should marry to see it very soon with their own eyes. Should they have a beautiful rest of the week. Happy Purim. And may our life will be full of laughter and happiness. Yeah.